Now, we say that um, perfect multicollinearity cause a serious problem, but that doesn't mean that we cannot have correlated X variables in a regression equation. The X variables can be correlated. The point of multiple regression is to include correlated X variables, okay? So that we can separate the effect of different but correlated random variables. So um, we can allow correlation. We can even allow highly correlated random variables in X. And highly even highly correlated random variables is not a problem on its own, as long as it's not perfect. But highly correlated random variables, highly correlated X variables, uh, when combined with small sample size, can mean that you cannot precisely estimate some of the coefficients. Now, I wanna give you an example um, continuing the gender example as before. Uh, suppose now your data set uh, is collected with uh, progressive thoughts. Gender is not binary. Suppose gender is not binary. So fi plus mi is not exactly one for all i. There might be individuals who are not willing to be identified as either f or m. In that case, you do not have perfect multicollinearity. So fi plus mi equals one doesn't hold exactly. As a result, um, however, um, people who are not willing to identify either as either f or m is a small minority. So there are non-binary individuals out there, but there are very few of them. As a result, say you're, you have a, a data set that contains 1,000 individuals. In your 1,000 data set, in your data set of 1,000 individuals, you have only two who are non-binary, for whom fi plus mi is not one, but zero. In that case, you can still run the ordinary square um, regression, you can still calculate the ordinary least square estimator. However, you won't be able to estimate beta zero very accurately. Uh, why beta zero? The reason is beta zero is the expected Y for those who are neither female or male. So for whom so beta zero is the expected Y. So under the first assumption that EU given F and M given gender equals zero. Um, so under A1, EY given that the person is non-binary, not female or male equals beta zero. So beta zero is the expected Y for those who are non-binary, but you have only two individuals who are non-binary in your data set. With a sample size of two, you are not able to estimate this expectation very precisely. Okay, so, so high correlation uh, is not a problem per se, but when you combine that with a relatively small sample size, you can run into this problem um, that you cannot estimate some of the parameters precisely. This does not mean that your estimator is inconsistent. The, the ordinary least square estimator is still consistent even when your X variables are highly correlated. This simply means that you need a larger sample size than n equals a thousand. Say maybe you want a sample size of n equals hundred thousand. Or maybe you want to use some other sampling schemes that will give you more non-binary um, observations in the data set. So, okay, so that's the discussion of the fourth assumption. Now, 
let's try to prove the consistency of the ordinary least square estimator. Um, just to sum up the assumptions that we introduced, we want the error term to be orthogonal to the vector one and to all the x variables. So the error term should be have expectation zero and should have zero correlation with any of the x variables. And we want the sample to be an IID sample. And we want finite kurtosis or unlikely large outlier. And we want no perfect multicollinearity, which implies that this matrix is invertible. Okay, so now let's try to prove the consistency of the ordinary least square estimators under these four assumptions. To do that, we start with the explicit formula that we derived in last lecture for the ordinary least square estimator, which is this. The first thing we do is that we're gonna multiply one over N to this summation and also multiply one over N to the summation inside the square, inside the bracket. Doing that will not change the value because this one over N is multiplied to something that's inside the inverse. So what we are actually doing is multiplying N, right? And if we multiply N and then divide by N, the value of the expression doesn't change. So beta can be written as this form. That's the sample average of this random matrix inverse times the sample average of this random vector. The next thing we do is to remember that y, remember y is equal to this linear function of x plus ui. So that is the linear regression equation we started with. Remember that's the linear regression equation we started with. Now we're gonna plug that in this formula, replace yi by this formula. So we replace this yi by that formula, we get here, we get this. The next step is to distribute this x vector to these two terms in the parenthesis. So this product becomes xi xi prime beta plus xi times ui. Right, so that becomes xi, xi prime beta plus xi ui. Now that's the sum of this sum. We, for this, the sum of this sum is a very long sum. We can collect all the terms with the x, xi prime beta and write them together, that, that is the sum of xi, xi prime beta. And we can collect all the terms with x u and put them in this summation. So that becomes the summation of x ui. And therefore that can be written as this pink matrix inverse times this sum of x, xi, x, x prime beta and this pink matrix inverse times the sum of x ui. Now let's focus on this first sum and this term. For this term, as you can see, the beta vector doesn't have a subscript i, so it can be factored out of the whole summation or average. It can be factored out, but because it was on the left before, once you factor it out, you still keep it on the left, sorry, on the right, not on the left. But now once you factor that out, you see this matrix is actually equal to the matrix inside the inverse. 
So that's the matrix inverse times the matrix itself. By the definition of inverse, these two cancel out and you get an identity matrix. The product of these two is the identity matrix. An identity matrix times beta equals beta. So that so this term becomes beta. Now I'm not doing anything about this term. I just copy it um, and write it here. So beta hat becomes beta plus this estimation error. Now let's move on to the next page. So beta hat equals beta plus the estimation error, which is written in this way. Now, as you can see, beta hat minus beta is in fact a function of this random, uh, random matrix and this random vector. Now, if we define a function little g of a matrix q and the vector r to be q inverse r, then this estimation error beta hat minus beta will be g of sample average of x, x prime and sample average of x, u. So that is our qn matrix, and that is our rn vector. Right? So the reason we do that is we want to use the Slasky theorem. Uh, we talked about one version of the Slasky theorem, and here this is another version, which is basically the same as before just in a different notation. To introduce the Slasky theorem, you consider a sequence of random matrices, Qn, and a sequence of random vectors, Rn, and also consider a function G of Q and R. Suppose that each of the sequence converge in probability, so the random matrix converges in probability to a non-random matrix, Q0, and the random vector converges to a non-random vector R0. And also suppose the function G is continuous at this limiting point. Then the function G preserves convergence in probability. Okay, so that's the Slasky theorem, which just which um, simply says continuous function preserves convergence in probability. Now, um, you might be wondering what we mean by a random matrix sequence converges to a matrix. Well, that we simply means that uh, each element of the matrix of Qn converges to the corresponding element of Q0. All right, so that's the vector uh, version of the Slasky theorem. And we can use that next. Uh, but, but before using that, we notice that this is our Q n, and this is our R n. And G is a continuous function, except at points where Q is not invertible, right? At any point where Q is invertible, it is a continuous function. So we want to use the Slasky theorem in order to apply the Slasky theorem, we want to show that this Qn converges in probability to something, this Rn converges in probability to something, and we want to also make sure that the probability limit of the Qn is an invertible matrix, so that it's on the continuous part of the G function. All right, so next we will work on the Qn, so this is our this is actually our Qn. Qn matrix. And this is actually the Rn vector. The Qn matrix converges in probability to this Q0 matrix. The reason is Every element of this sequence is a sample average of an IID random variable. So for example, the first element 
is 1 over n sum i from 1 to n. So not this, this is actually not the first element. The first element is 1. Um, but we can that one is trivial. We can consider uh, the second diagonal element, which is 1i times 1i. And because the x1i's are independent and identically distributed, the x1i times x1i is also independent and identically distributed across i. So if you treat that as a random variable and across i is iid, you can apply the law of large number and shows that this converges in probability to expected value of x1i, x1i. So that's by the law of large number that we have covered before. You apply that to every element of this matrix and you are able to show that this random matrix sequence converges to this non-random matrix. Same thing happens here. You can apply the law of large number for this uh, random, uh, for this sample average of this random vector and show that this converges in probability to expected value of the random vector. So that is the limit R0. Now, I want to show that this R0 is actually zero. And that actually follows from the orthogonality condition. The reason that it follows is that this E X vector U equals E equals E of one X one to X K times U where U is a scalar. So that is actually U X one U X K U. An expectation of a random vector equals the vector formed by the ex expectation of each element. And that is zero. Each element is zero by A1, by the orthogonality assumption. So this R is actually zero. Now we are ready to apply the Slutsky theorem. Um, we can apply the Slutsky theorem also because this matrix is invertible by the non-perfect multicollinearity assumption. And therefore G of QR is continuous at this limiting point. So we can apply the Slutsky generalized, uh, sorry, we can apply the Slutsky theorem and show that beta hat equals beta plus G of QN RN converges to beta hat, sorry, not beta hat, converges to beta plus G of Q0 R0. And G of Q0 R0 is the Q0 inverse times R0, but R0 is zero. So therefore, the limit of the ordinary least square estimator is the true value. 